All right, good evening, everyone. We're at seven o'clock and recording. So it's good to have you all on such a wonderful day here in Parma, New York. Been snowing since whenever, and we finally have some snow on the ground. So praise the Lord. Patsy Cliff is with us. All right, good to have Patsy with us. Okay, let's do this this evening. Let's go over to uh, Leviticus chapter 23. We've been studying the, the feast days. All right. And the, I should say times of the feast. And does anybody remember who these feasts are, who they belong to? Any idea? God. God. They're God's feasts, not Israel's feasts. They're God's feasts. Okay. So they're called the feasts of the Lord as we see that. So let's go over to uh, chapter 23 and verse number nine. I'll read down through verse number 14. And this covers what we call the first fruit, the Feast of the first fruit, all right, or first fruits. So in verse 9 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old, without defect, for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall then be two-tenths of an ephod, a fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for the soothing aroma, with its drink offering a fourth of a hand of wine. Until the same day, until you have brought in the offering of your God, you shall eat neither bread nor roasted grain nor new growth. It is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generation in all your dwelling places. All right. So that's a mouthful that I just read you. Uh, but it has to do with the, the Feast of the First Fruits, which we'll check out here in, in just a minute. So let's have a word of prayer, please. Father. I do thank you for all the saints that have joined us this evening. I pray that uh, your word would be a blessing to them uh, tonight. Might they not take my word for what I've studied, but might they look at it uh, for themselves, that they get it ingrained in their own hearts and their own minds as to your plan of redemption. And Father, we'll thank you for that in Christ's name. And amen. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just do a little review here before we get into the uh, first fruits. All right. Now, we understand, according to verse number five, that in the first month on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And this is where we started. The Passover starts uh, everything on the uh, 14th of the first month. Now, the first month is either Abed, according to the Canaanite calendar, or it is Nisan, according to the Babylonian calendar, which the Jews picked up with the second temple. <clears throat> okay, as we see this. So... We know that the Passover in our studies was the day that the Lord went to the cross and he died and he was interned. He, he was buried, all right, on that day. Now, let me make a little, little correction of this, because last week I said I believe it was on the th Thursday that this occurred, but that can't be because he has to be three full days uh, in the grave, uh, you know, before he raises from the dead. So it's going to be on a Wednesday, all right? And I believe that for years. But at any rate, at, uh, Wednesday, Passover, Thursday, then will be the first day of the unleavened bread, which you'll see here in a moment. Friday, nothing is recorded about it. Saturday is the regular Sabbath. And then on the first day of the week is going to be the first fruits, Feast of the First Fruit, all right? And it's going to be that way every year that they begin to uh, uh, celebrate this if you please, all right? And remember, what does Passover represent? Well, according to chapter 12 of Exodus, verses three to six, it, it represents redemption. Remember the angel, the death, we call it the death angel came and the firstborn of uh, all the uh, humans and the animals in Egypt uh, were slain, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's what we see there. Now, when we get down to the unleavened bread, that's verses 6 to 8 in Leviticus 23. 
That's on that begins on the 15th of the month. All right. And it runs for seven days. The first day is a Sabbath day. The last day is a Sabbath day. All right. Now, what does the unleavened bread represent to us as we saw? Well, it's freedom from slavery in Egypt and the world as we look at this. And so there was to be no leaven to be consumed during that time frame. Leaven is nothing. We, we talked about that last week. Someone says it was bubbles you know, that come up in the bread. And, uh, you know, when I go to, I hate to tell you this, but when I go to Subway, when I travel with the brochures and stay overnight, I usually have my evening meal at Subway. And I always get a flatbread sandwich, okay, instead of the puffy stuff. <laughs> it's not because of the leaven, but it's just what I prefer. Okay, but that's the idea there between a flat bread, no leaven, and then when it gets the leaven in it, what's it do? It expands, but it's nothing but air actually in there, okay, and, and space as you see that. And we find that in Exodus chapter 12 uh, and verses 14 to 20. But when we get to the New Testament and talk about leaven, leaven is represented to us as sin. You remember. Now, I'll give you some verses. I'm not going to read too many of them. But sin, influence, and hypocrisy. And all three of those words are wrapped up around the Pharisees and the Sadducees as we read the Gospels. For example, uh, in Luke chapter number 12, verses 1 to 10. Let, let's go over there just for an example here. So you'll catch this. Luke chapter 12. And here we are. Let's notice verses, uh, well, I'll just start reading. It says, under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Hypocrisy. Now, we could read all the way down to verse number 10 if, if you wanted. Okay, but well, we don't need to do that. You can you can do that yourselves. Then we noticed uh, Galatians chapter uh, five. Let's turn over there. All right, Galatians chapter number five, please. And I believe we want verse number nine, where it says, "A little leaven leaven leaveneth the whole lump of dough." All right, the lump of dough. Now, the context here begins in chapter 4, verse 21, where we have the story here of Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman, if you'll remember that, okay? Hagar, down in verse 25, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Now, notice what he says. Paul's writing this, so there's a time frame here. And when he's writing this, he's saying, hey, listen, Jerusalem is in slavery. They haven't recognized what these feasts mean and what Christ has accomplished for them. So they're still in slavery, actually, to the old covenant. And that's what this is all about, okay? But the Jerusalem above, verse 26, is free. She is our mother, for it is written, rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So Ishmael persecuted, all right, Isaac, as we see there. But what does the scripture say? Verse number 30, cast out the bondwoman and her son. That's the old covenant. Remember, it's an allegory here. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of a free woman. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. So what we find is this, that the unleavened bread then is a picture of people that were freed from their slavery, right? 
And when we get to the New Testament, it's connected with sin and hypocrisy and influence of those leaders, uh, um, you'd call them religious leaders, that refused to recognize what was happening in God's plan, right, for Israel. Now, <laughs> free, they had, let me just say this, they had freedom uh, to follow the Lord. Come on back with me to uh, Exodus, please. Now, this is all review, but come on back there. Let's come back to Exodus, please, in chapter number 13. Exodus chapter 13. And notice verses 17 and 18. Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Hence, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up, okay, in array from the land of Egypt, as we see this. So they were set free, and God chose to take them by way of the Red Sea uh, for their freedom, if you believe. So what they did, if you remember, the Lord appeared to them, God, Yahweh appeared to them, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So he was with them the whole trip that they were doing this. Now, last week, I <clears throat> shared something that I read about how in the deserts out there that the people make ice, okay? And uh, then Ron mentioned something to me about Hori, okay, and the breath of God. And so I had, I had to look that up, and Susan and I both looked it up. But in Job 37.10, if you turn over there with me, Job 37.10, watch this. All right, where are we? Here we go. Thirty Job. It's found in another place, a number of places. And I'll, as soon as my fingers get to turn the pages here. All right. Job 37.10 says, From the breath of God, ice is made. And the expanse of the waters is frozen. All right. From the breath, ice is made. Now, if you have a uh, reference Bible there, you can run the references. And you're going to say it, it appears again in Job and then a couple other places. And what we were saying is this, or what I said from what I read, and it was from a Jewish commentary, is that when Moses, you know, struck the Red Sea with the rod or lifted it up there, and, and the breath of God began to blow, that actually what was holding the water up was the breath of God, which is ice. So I thought that was very fascinating. I had never, you know, in my 40 plus years of, of a believer read anything like that or had that uh, presented to me. So I thought that was pretty good. So I thank Ron for that uh, reference that he shared with us, all right, uh, in relationship to that. Now, when we look at the... Uh, feast days. How many feast days were there? Anybody remember? The feasts of the Lord, how many are there? Seven. All right, Miss Haley says seven. Seven is a number of completeness, all right, of completeness, meaning, and what we've seen so far is that the feast days have to do and point towards the redemption that God has, not just for Israel, but for mankind. So seven is the number of completeness, as we see here. So what we found now so far is in the Old Testament, there's types and shadows, right? Types and shadows. And if you look at, uh, think about this. Whenever there is a, I, I've got to officiate, I would say, at, at a wedding. I've never married anybody. People, a man and woman marry each other, right? <laughs> to officiate that, there's always a rehearsal the night before or a couple nights before. So people know what's going on. Well, look at the types and shadows as a rehearsal. So in the Old Testament, you see the rehearsal of what's going to take place when the Lord comes, see? And then fulfilling, the Lord will fulfill all these feast days, okay? To the total plan now of salvation as you look at this. So they all point then to the Messiah, 
Uh, let's go to Acts, if you would, in chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And just notice verses 1 and 2 with me. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Actually, uh, 1 through 3. Now, when they had traveled through Amphilopolis and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. Now, what scriptures was he using? When we get to Acts 17, Paul hadn't written any yet. None of the New Testament had been written. So what scriptures is he using? Well, he, the has, Old to be, Testament. he has to be using the Old Testament. Thank you very much. Okay, the Old Testament is what he's using. Notice chapter 18 with me in verse 28. Okay, 18, 28, last verse. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now, again, this is Paul. Okay, this is Paul. Um, come on back to John chapter 5. Any of you folks have been with us since the beginning. You remember a verse that used to hang over the side door? It hung there for 30 years. All right. Notice verse uh, chapter 5, John and verse 46. All right, 46. Here it says, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So who did Moses write about? Christ, about the Messiah. Didn't name him. But the verse we had is search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. It comes out of John. So the word scripture there, even in that verse, was a reference to the Old Testament. Okay, one more place here. Come over to Luke 24 with me, please. And uh, Luke 24 and verse 27. Now, you, we remember the story about the road to Emmaus where the Lord appeared and walked along with the two disciples. Then he revealed themsel himself to them when he broke bread at their house, and then he, he's, he was gone. And the two disciples went back to Jerusalem uh, to tell the apostles what had happened. But when they got there, they found out that Jesus already appeared to them. Okay? okay. But here's what happens. Notice verse 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, this is what Jesus did with the disciples when he met them after the resurrection. Okay? All the things concerning himself. And where did he get the stuff? From the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. So it's very important that you keep that in mind and, and remember that. Uh, the Old Testament, all right? Shadows and types is a rehearsal of the New Testament fulfillment that's going to be fulfilled by, or was fulfilled, I should say, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I think we can make this statement that the Torah, that's the first five books, okay, and the Tanakh, which is all the scriptures of the Old Testament, is a journey, okay, to a revelation of the one who will die on the cross. That one, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Old Testament gives witness to that, right? And keep that in mind. So what we find is this, 1,600 years to the date that our Lord died on the Feast of Passover, on the 14th of Nisan, 1,600 years prior to that, on the first Passover, back in Egypt, Okay, the story of redemption begins there and how God's going to do it with the death of the uh, firstborn in Egypt, but with what? The freedom, the setting free 
of Israel. Okay, of Israel. And uh, let me share this with you. I keep running into more and more information concerning what was going on. Come back to Isaiah 11, if you would. Isaiah chapter number 11. Okay, 8, 10, and 11. Yeah, I, I told my wife that uh, <laughs> today I was reading through a John commentary by uh, Father Raymond Brown. It's in two volumes. It's 1,200 pages. Very, very detailed. And uh, uh, Raymond Brown, is a, he, he has a set of books out called <coughs> The Day Christ Was Crucified. That's just as big as this John commentary. It's just amazing to me how a man <coughs> can make it his life work just to do a study like that, you know. But he was saying how Isaiah was the most uh, optimistic of the prophets. And that Jeremiah was the most negative of the prophets. And that Ezekiel was probably the most mystical of the prophets. And you read any of the prophets there, and it's hard to get anything that sounds optimistic, you know, as you look at that. But at any rate, uh, we're in chapter, what did I say, 11? All right, of Isaiah. Let me get over to 11. I'm in 10 still. And notice with me verses 11 and 12, if you would. Uh, let's see. Isaiah chapter 11, 11 and 12. Yeah, this is what I want. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand. The remnant of his people who will remain, who remain, from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up the standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corner corners of the earth, right? Four corners of the earth. And I say, well, what, what are you talking about here? Notice what it says will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people. When was the first time? Egypt. Out of Egypt. Now there's a second exodus then, you see? Now, now hang in here with me, okay? As, as, as you look at this, come back with me to Matthew. Now this is right within our study, the parameters of it. So I know that nobody's really in a hurry here. Okay, notice with me Matthew chapter 2, talking about a second exodus, chapter 2 here of Matthew, and verses 14 and 15. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. Of course, they're leaving for Egypt because the angel tells them this, that somebody's coming to kill all the children that are two years and younger, right? All the boys. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. That is not a reference to the first Exodus. That is a reference to the second Exodus when Jesus is called out. And it's found in Hosea. Chapter 11 and verse number one. You write that down. You can look at it later. All right. And, and, and to me, I find that very interesting. All right. And I say, well, I tell you, let's go to Hosea. Let's let's read it. As long as we're not in a hurry. Hosea chapter 11. Verse number one. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Okay. Now, Matthew equates it to whom? The nation of Israel or to the son of God? He equates it to the son of God here. Okay. 
So let me see if I can explain this better to you. Come with me to Exodus 15. All right, Exodus 15. You need to get a better desk here. Mm. Wife. I'm, I'm working at an angle here with a lap, lap desk here. All right, chapter 15 of Exodus. And let's read here verses 1 to 6. Watch what it says. Now, <clears throat> the sea is divided in chapter 14. Okay. And now in chapter 15, the Israelites are on the other side, the Red Sea. And they start singing. All right. Because this is Moses' song, if you want to say, say that. So it says there in verse 1, Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. See that? He's become my salvation. This idea of freedom, redemption. Okay. Um, this is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. Greg Boyd has a couple books out called The Warrior God. Uh, and, and my son Dan got me those, those books a number of years ago. And, and they're just tremendous. It's about the Lord, Jesus, okay? The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. And the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemies. Okay? Shatters the enemies. And when you read through the scriptures, now watch this. <laughs> Hang in here with me. Your right hand. Remember that? Come to Psalm 118, please. Psalm 118. All right, here's 09, Psalm 118, and let's notice verses 15 and 16. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. And what did we just read in Exodus 15 with the song? It's the right hand of the Lord. Come back to Psalm 89, please. Psalm 89. Now we're going we're gonna to get here to the feast in just a moment. Okay. Notice verse 13. You have a strong arm. Your hand is mighty. Your right hand is exalted. Your right hand is exalted. Now what we're going to see here is this. As, as you look at this, all right, he's talking here about, you know, when you see the word Lord, all caps, that's a title, not a name. The name is Adoniah, you see. So his right hand is what uh, brings forth the redemption to his people. And I think we have to remember that. So I, I have to call my wife because I want to put up a, Susan? <laughs> I want to put up a illustration here for you. Okay. So she was kind enough to make this up for me. Be patient with me now. Okay. Let's go to I get my mouse to work. Sorry. It's all right. There you go. All right. So they're seeing this over here. Can you all see the chart there? Yep. Okay. You can see the chart. Now, <laughs> good. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> this will be up here for a few minutes. Now, what I did was this. Here's the seven feasts that we see. Numbers one, two, three, four, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost are in the spring. 
Remember the calendar, God's new calendar that he began, you know, in Nisan with Israel has to do with the agricultural year and has to do with uh, uh, the harvesting here at the barley here in, in the first part. Then in the last three, the trumpets, atonement and tabernacles, they also have to do with the harvest. And that how harvest has to do with wheat. Now, here's what the interesting thing is, and see if you can just follow me in this. I want you to understand what's going on, all right? These feasts now were not celebrated by Israel, as we've seen in the past, until they came into a place that was chosen by God himself. And there's a number of verses that we gave you on that to make a name for himself. And, of course, that's the temple, see? So these feasts are celebrated in the temple, all right? So what we find is this, that in the lifetime of our Lord Jesus Christ, second, second Exodus, as a child, all right? And then to his public ministry, which starts how long later? 30 years later, right? There's a 40-year time frame for these uh, feasts to be fulfilled by the Lord, all right, by the Lord. The first four, or first three, take place, right, his, his, the cross work, then his burial, and then the first fruits, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Then 50 days after the first fruits is what we call Pentecost. Now, as we look at this, these feasts take place in a 40-year time frame. Now, how long was Israel in the wilderness? 40 years. So we say that's a number of testing, right? Uh, the Lord in the, in the desert tempted 40, 40 days, that, that sort of thing. So as we look at this, what we find is this, if I can do this with you, and I don't know if this, is, this is, can't be correct. Uh, what we have is this. Okay. Uh, now I got to remember this. Forgive me. These aren't years. These are days. They're days. We got there. Yeah. 55 I'm days. Sorry. That's an error. And, and not, yeah, Susan misread that. 55 days and then 22 yeah. days. So yeah. once Passover starts till the end of Pentecost is 55 days. Then once trumpets comes and tabernacles finish, it's 22 days. Okay, y'all follow me there? Now, what we have is this then. The total time frame of this in relationship to our Lord is 40 years. From the Passover of his death to his, we call his coming again to tabernacles, is a 40-year time frame. 30 AD to 70, uh, to 70 AD. Okay, so as a result of that, there's 39.8 years between Pentecost and trumpets. And it happened, the trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles happened 22 years. Now, what happens is this. This is during the time when the Jews are celebrating this, but the Lord is doing something else. He's fulfilling it, just like he did Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. Okay, and then he's going to fulfill trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. So we see the whole plan of God fulfilled there, okay, within these, what, feast days. And that was the purpose of them. So they were, in the Old Testament, a type and shadow, a rehearsal, okay? But when you get to the New Testament, what happens? It's a fulfillment of it. The Lord fulfills. Now, is that difficult to understand? Everybody got that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Try to make it simple. So, Susan, you can come and switch this over, please. All right, and we'll get going here with the uh, first fruits. All right, what time is it? 34, yes, we have time, I believe. Maybe we have time. We'll, we'll make time. All <laughs> right. All right, here we go. So the first fruits, then, we see in Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14. So let's come on back there. And we'll run through it real quickly, and then we'll tell you what it's all about and, and what it actually is, is talking about. Now, notice with me, first of all, verse 10. 
to speak to the sons of Israel. We're in Luke, or I mean, uh, Leviticus 23. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land, which I am going to give you, and reap its harvest. Now notice, they, there's a land waiting for them. We know that to be Canaan. Okay? And reap its harvest. So when they come into the land, there's going to be a harvest waiting on them. Then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. All right? To the priest. Now, what would happen, they'd go out and bundle some of the barley tied together. Then they cut it, and then they bring this to a priest. Okay? Bring it to a priest. Now, notice verse 11. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. So if they brought this first fruits and they were accepted of the Lord. And it happens on the day, notice verse 11, on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So that'd be the first day of the week, Sunday, not the Sabbath, Saturday, okay, is, is what happens there, okay, as, as you look at it. And they wave it before the Lord. Uh, just write this down. I, I don't have time to read it all, but Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 10, shows us that when they did this, and we're faithful to do this, then the Lord would be faithful to bring in the rest of the harvest. Okay. And you find that in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 to 10. So this happened now on the first day of the week, first day after the Sabbath. The Saturday Sabbath is when, when it happened. Okay. Then in verses 12 and 13, it says, Now the now on the day when you wave the sheaf. You shall offer a male lamb, one year old, without a defect, for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall then be two-tenths of an ephod, a fine flour, with oil. Now, my, which I'm going to read here in a minute, my Jewish Bible, uh, study Bible, says it's a gallon worth of materials here, okay? As, as, you, as you see this. Uh, where am I? Okay. Uh, with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for soothing aroma, with its drink offering, a fourth of a hind of, uh, of wine, okay, fourth wine. Now, notice what it says in verse 14, until the same day, until you have brought it uh, in, or brought in the offering of your God, you shall eat neither bread, nor roasted grain, nor new growth. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations, in all your dwelling places. So during this time frame, they could not eat of anything, okay? They had to do with the grain, as you see, until they brought that sheaf uh, 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 offering to God, okay? Now remember, it's in the, in the temple. Now, let me give you a summary of this. <clears throat> this comes from the complete Jewish Bible, okay, that I've had now for... A number of months it's been a blessing to me okay on the most part I'll, I'll say but notice what it says here as we look at this and I'll, I'll keep it as simple as I I can it says this uh, this day celebrates the first of spring when the first of the barley harvest was brought as an offering to the priest in the tabernacle or temple the lesson was clear if God has been faithful to bless with an early harvest, then he will most certainly provide the harvest of later summer, okay? The Jewish observance of this festival had varied throughout history. In the days of the temple, bringing the offering as Thanksgiving tithe to God was quite an elaborate ceremony. The Talmud states that a priest would, need, would meet a group of Jewish pilgrims at the edge of the city and then lead them to, up to the Temple Mount. As they carried their offerings of the first fruits, the priests would lead a praise service with music, the hail, psalms, and dance. Now, the hail are Psalms 113 through 118. As the worshipers arrived at the temple compound, the priests would take the barley sheaves, lift some in the air, and wave them in every direction. By doing so, the whole crowd would be acknowledging God's provision and sovereignty 
over all the earth. Now that's in printed in the Bible here, but they got it from Mr. Erdersheim, uh, his book called The Temple. Okay, Erdersheim has four or five excellent books out. One is called The uh, Life and Times of Jesus Christ. And again, that's another thousand page book and it's worth every penny it has. So there we see like a summary of what the Jews did, okay, of, of what they did. But what does it mean to us? Okay, what does it mean? Well, let's find out and see what the New Testament has to say. Come to 1 Corinthians with me in chapter 15. All right, 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 15. <clears throat> All right. Now, let's pick it up in verse number 20, please. And I'll go down through 23. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. Notice what it says now. The first fruits of those who are asleep. Mm -hmm. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those are who are Christ at his coming. Okay, as, as we see this. So the, the harvest was consecrated in the temple by the priest. Now, what happened when Christ raised from the dead? Well, we'll see that in a few minutes when he went back to the Father and then came back down. He also was consecrated, but we'll see that here in a minute. Now, come back to Romans, if you would, in chapter 8. Now, I really don't know how much to... Uh, share with you concerning this but notice what it says in verse 23 chapter 8 of romans verse 23 and not only this but also we ourselves now who's the we ourselves here it's the believers in rome plus paul right remember audience relevance mm -hmm. got to keep that in mind here and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. Okay, first fruits. Now, when is that going to happen? That's going to happen Pentecost. We'll see that next week, okay, as we look at this, okay? Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. Or we, I think I taught adoption as sons. The redemption of what? Body. Of whose body? our body that's a plural not an individual okay the redemption of our body talking about at this time frame the very body we call it the body of Christ okay not individual bodies the body of Christ that's, that's important we're going to get to that one day, okay, and, and share that with you. In fact, maybe I'll get to it tonight a little bit. I don't know. Let's come back to John 11, please. So, again, we see the first fruit there connected with the redemption of who Paul says, our body, those folks that were there and alive at that time. I come over to chapter 11 now of John. And let's read verses 25 through 27, please. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, that can be a little confusing there, can't it? So what kind of death won't they die? The sin death that we talked about with Adam, okay? Because the physical death, they will die, but not the sin death. So watch now. I'm going back to 1 Corinthians one more time. Are you trying to confuse me, Brother Dan? <laughs> no. Let's notice this. When we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Chapter 15, notice verses 4 through 7. 
that he was buried, and that he raised on the third day. What was the third day in, with the Jewish feast days? It was the first fruit. All right. It was the Sunday after the Sabbath, which was Saturday. Christ went to the cross and was buried on Wednesday. The next day, Thursday, was a Sabbath because of unleavened bread. Then, then Friday's a blank, and then you have Saturday as the regular Sabbath day. Then the first day of the week, the first fruits, Christ raises from the dead, right? Then it says this, uh, raised on a third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So the Lord appeared to more than 500 people at once during that time frame when he was on the earth before his ascension, right? And what was that for? Okay. Uh, it was to encourage the saints, to let them know that these feasts are being fulfilled, right? To that date and time, the first three feasts had been fulfilled. Now, the apostles were told to wait in a room, remember that? For the coming of the <laughs> Spirit, which we'll see next week, okay? And how that works. Now, when then, let me ask you this question. When were the believers raised? That we saw later on in 1 Corinthians. Okay, when were they raised? That, that, that's a question. Now, I'll say this to you. They were raised when the second exodus ended. Now, when did the second exodus end? Okay. Well, it ended, according to Daniel, write these verses down. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Daniel saw a great tribulation coming. Matthew 24, 21, the Lord said this great tribulation is coming. When that tribulation, how's it end? When the Lord comes back again, okay? It ends for the believers, not for everybody else, because that, that battle with Rome that the Jews were going through extends for another number of years, okay? So it's very, very interesting. Now, let me just say this to you and, and see if you can grab onto this simply, all right? All bodies in the scripture that we saw raised from the dead, and there's a number of them, aren't there? I mean, the Lord raised Lazarus, young lady, a young man, okay? And they were raised. But what happened to those folks? Was died that again. a resurrection? They died. No, no, they died again. Died. They died again. Uh, in fact, if we, uh, let's see, did I write this down? I don't know if I did. Uh, yeah, I did. So I'll, I'll get to it in a little bit. But they were resuscitated and then they died again. So they weren't truly resurrected. All right. Remember this in Genesis 319. God told Adam, you came from dust. And to dust, you are going to what? return. Now, let me encourage it to this to this end. As a futurist. Uh, what did I say? Turn to second Corinthians, please. Chapter five. As a futurist waiting for the coming of the Lord. I didn't believe anybody was raised from dead and nobody that is a futurist believes that because they're waiting, say, for the coming of the Lord. We believe that we sleep, we slept in the Lord, okay? Paul uses that terminology. The Lord Jesus Christ uses that terminology. And the reason they did is because prior to the Lord's return at the end of his second exodus, okay, that's what was going on with, with folks. They were, they were sleeping. Now, notice with me, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And see if this makes sense to you. 
And again, this is something you can look at. You have a concordance, you have your Bible. For we know, verse 1 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. Now, what's your earthly tent? Our bodies. Your, your body, your, your flesh, right? We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan. What house? This earthly tent. Longing to be clothed with our dwelling from where? Heaven. And who makes that dwelling? God. No human hands make that. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened. Because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. In other words, we don't want to die. Nobody does, do they? In the flesh. So that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Swallowed up by our tent that God makes. See? Now, he who has prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the spirit as a what? As a pledge. Right? Simple enough to understand? There's nowhere that I can find in scripture where there's a promise of the resurrection of the physical body. You have to eliminate 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in order to come up with that. Okay? Now, that's something for you to think about. I'm not asking you to believe me. Think about it. Read the scripture. See what, see what happens. Okay. See what happens. Now, let me give you another note here as we go on. <clears throat> Remember this. That the New Testament falls into the framework of the feasts of God that are found in the Old Testament. And so what is falling into the framework of the Old Testament feast days is the redemptive plan of God himself. And he shows it in the Old Testament. We see that the Old Testament are the scriptures that declare what is true about our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul had it twice before he even wrote a scripture. So that was used. That's what we see. Now, hang in here. Come back to John. We're almost finished here. We have a few minutes. Come back to John, please, in chapter 20. Now, I want to leave you on a high note. Okay. On a high note. John chapter 20, and uh, let's read verses 16 and 17. Uh, the story here is Mary Magdalene has come to the tomb on the first day of the week. And she sees the tomb is empty. She's heartbroken, right, as, as you see this. And in verse 15, it says, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni which means teacher. So she recognized him when he said her name, just like Lazarus. I mean, what did Jesus say to raise Lazarus you know, out from the dead? His first name. Okay. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. For I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father and my God, and your God. Mm -hmm. And Mary did what was told of her, verse 18. Now, why do you bring us up, Brother Dan? Quit clinging to me. He had to go to be with the Father. The high priest, I'll only say this to you. The high priest in the temple offered the last lamb. We talked about this last week. Remember, he brought it into the temple on his shoulders. And then for four days, the little lamb was sequestered right there. So nothing would happen to it. That's the last lamb that was offered during the course of the day when 240,000 uh, lambs were offered on that day when the Lord passed on or was killed, actually. Okay. 
I should say, gave his life. He gave it voluntarily. But what we find is this. The high priest, after offering the last lamb on the Passover, went into seclusion so as not to be defiled before the feast of the first fruits. So after the high priest offered that little lamb, right, he went into the temple and didn't leave until the feast of the first fruits. Why is that? Because he had to come out and wave the sheaves. Now, here's what I found out. This is very interesting. I mean, this, this Jewish Bible is full of all kinds of information. The priests had a garden down in the valley of Hinnom. Okay, or Gehenna, I should say. And that's the garbage dump, right? Where people were cast and, and garbage was cast. But right next to that, they had a garden. And so what would happen is this. They grew barley and grew wheat. Not a whole lot of it, enough to celebrate the feast days. So once the last lamb was offered, the high priest went into seclusion in the temple. Then some other priests went down and what they did is they wrapped barley, bundled it, but they didn't cut it down until the first fruits. They cut it down. They brought it into the temple. The high priest would come out and he would wave it before the Lord, okay, in every direction. Remember, we already read that. Now I say, well, well, what's the deal? Well, come over to Hebrews, please, in chapter three. All right. Hebrews chapter three, please. All right. <sighs> Hebrews chapter 3, and let's notice verse number 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So who was the high priest that ministered in a temple? He was a type and a shadow of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to chapter 5 with me, if you would. And let's notice verse number 10. Uh, I tell you, verse number 9. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, why wasn't he a priest after the order of Aaron? Because he wasn't a Levite, <laughs> okay? Came from the tribe of Judah. So the order, so Christ then was a high priest. He still is a high priest as, as we see this. And so when he came, he went up to the temple, okay? Uh, to the throne of God, I should say, okay? A after leaving Mary, don't cling to me, Mary. I still have to go up to my father. I believe there's where he deposited, the sprinkled the blood on what we call the mercy seat or the throne of God, okay? Then he came down, and then he could be what? As we see later on by the apostles and stuff, he could be touched. Stick your hand in my, or your finger, your hand in, into my wounds. Remember that? Now, that sort of thing. So then he, he was good, just like the high priest, if we would, would say that, okay? Now, watch this. <clears throat> come back to Matthew. Okay, let's do this. Get Luke 19 in one hand. I'm almost finished here with you, okay? Or with our study tonight, I should say. And Matthew 27. Matthew 27 with Luke 19. Now watch Matthew 27 and verse, verses 50 to 53. Okay? 50 says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. Matthew 27, 50. And yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened. And many bodies of the saints, those who had believed in Christ, who had fallen asleep. Remember the term sleep? Were raised. And coming out of the tombs. Now notice what it says. After his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. So here you have a situation just like the Lazarus situation. Lazarus was raised, right? And then a couple of days later, they had a they had a big dinner 
<laughs> at his home, a lot of people there. And what did the Pharisees want to do with Lazarus? Does anybody remember? It wasn't a great miracle to them. They wanted to kill him. Yeah. Just like they wanted to kill the Lord Jesus. Well, here we have, when the veil is rent, see, the earth quakes and the tombs are open, but it's not until the Lord raises from the dead that what happens? These folks come out of the grave, just like Lazarus did, and they go into the city so people could see them. Now, I believe they were resuscitated, but watch this. Come to Luke, if you would. Where did I have you go to? Luke 19. Yes, Luke 19. Notice verse 40, uh, verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Okay. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. What are the stones here? What happened when the veil was rent? Mm. Earthquake? The grave yeah. open? What marks a grave? It's stone. A gravestone. And this finally makes sense to me. The stones will cry out. They're going to move aside so whoever's under can come up. Now, these are just things for you to think about. Because what we're talking about in first fruits is actually the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the first fruit of those that raised from dead, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay? So what I've given you is many things to look at. Okay? But I haven't gone in detail in any of them, actually. Just an overview of what the Feast of the First Fruits are. Now, one more thing, and I promise I'll let you go watch your movie tonight or whatever you're going to do. Okay? <laughs> Have dessert. Come back to John chapter number 19. <clears throat> okay? John chapter num number 19. Let's notice, please, verses 38 and 39. Now, hang in here for this. You'll be disappointed if you miss it. Okay. Verse 38. Now, this is after the our Lord gives up the ghost. Okay, gives the spirit back to the Father. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Now, what goes through my mind is these, these Jews that were disciples of Jesus had a fear of Pilate. You know, all the apostles fled, didn't they? As we remember, okay, fled. But here, perhaps Joseph of Arimathea knew Pilate, maybe from a party or something, I don't know. But watch what it says. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, John 3, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight, to prepare the body of the Lord for burial. Now, Joseph of Arimathea had a sepulcher reamed out of the rock for himself and had a stone that was able to be rolled over it. And I can imagine Pilate saying to him, after all that money you spent on a place to be buried, you're going to allow a criminal to be put in there and buried. As you know, Joseph tells Pilate, he says, it's no big deal. It's only for the weekend. And I'll close with that. Well, somebody understood. <laughs> only for the weekend, you know? So Joseph yep. will be buried in it again. This yep. And that, that's, what, that's what happens. So I hope this was a blessing to you. I, I'm trying to condense condense these, these studies the best I can, even though we've been going an hour for the last couple of them, okay? So Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. We had that all taken care of. 50 days from, if you read Leviticus 23, 
from the first fruits is the Feast of Pentecost. And that's what we'll look at next week. Okay. So listen, I have a phone number. You want to call me or text me. You do that on any questions you have and uh, it, it'll, it'll be glad to have you. Now do do this. Uh, keep my son, Dan.